Welcome, everyone. So glad you can be with me. Happy Easter weekend. We are here. We're in the resurrection. We are, I don't know about you, but I've just been soaring all week. They call this uh, Easter week on the calendar, but I've been like in the holy instant, just like soaring, you know, scrape me off the ceiling. I'm just having so much fun. I mean, Jesus has literally been playing with me all week. Um, earlier in the week, <clears throat> there was a movie that came out, and I think it was called Everything, Everywhere, All in, at Once. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I'm like, is that a title of a movie? I got high on the title. I mean, I enjoyed the movie, but I was just high on the title. I said, if that's the title of new movies, that's my life. <laughs> Everything, everywhere, all at once. I'm into simultaneity. I feel like I, I don't even believe in past lives. I don't believe in future lives. I don't believe in ambition. I don't feel regret for anything that I ever seemed to do because Jesus convinced me that I was, I was hallucinating. <laughs> Every time I try to have a thought about the past, he goes, are you going to keep up with this hallucination when all the glory of the present moment is right before you? Why would you fool with future thoughts or past thoughts? You know, I've been having Jesus like speak to me all week and he's been playing with, I'm out at the monastery and I'm just telling you, Jesus is playing games with us all. Everything is so funny. It's like a comedy. Uh, we have a new vehicle, electric vehicle, and it gets a flat tire. And then the comedy of trying to repair the tire, get a replacement tire, get a, a kit, a spare kit. It's just been a comedy of, of things that have been going on. And, and it's all around a tire. I mean, Jesus is playing with us with, with a tire. For a vehicle. He's just showing us it's all happening right now. Don't ever take any thought for the morrow. In fact, I'll add to that, don't take any thought for the past or the morrow, you know. And of course in miracles, Jesus says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is only remembered or anticipated. Remembered, that's the ego drawing on the past or anticipated, the ego projecting a future. So I hope you join me today in the glory of the present moment. I am, I am bursting in the power of now. Uh, and, and I think Jesus has given us a movie today that Pete said, it's one of our all time classics. Why is this movie so spectacular? Why is this movie so amazing that you could watch it and be transported into a state of mind that is what Easter is all about? <laughs> because Easter is, let's face it, Easter is a resurrection, right? This is Easter weekend and we're going into the resurrection and I'm just loving it so much because I know a lot of you like Christmas. Any Christmas lovers here? Yeah, yeah, Christmas, you know, that was pretty good. Celebrating the birth of Christ, you know, and Jesus came to demonstrate God's eternal love. I like that too. But that was just the birth of a little baby who would go on to demonstrate the divine presence in all of us, the I am presence that's before time, the I am presence that's the way, the truth, and the life. We don't have to give it a name in terms of people or avatars. Jesus tells us in the Course that the man, Jesus, was an illusion. Wow, that's a real resurrection idea. The man was an illusion because the, the Christ is pure light. The Christ is neither male nor female. Uh, I had a, a, a friend of mine who received, like, I don't know, about 270 songs from the angels and I think it was around Christmas one year, and she got this song from the angels, and it was from Jesus. And he was trying to correct our perception of him and of Easter and of everything. And, and this is the way the song goes. It's, it goes, 
Come down, come down, come down from the cross. There is no sin and your soul is not lost. You have been dreaming a world of sad thoughts. Come down, come down from the cross. How's that for an Easter greeting from Jesus? He's blowing away the cross. He's blowing away time and space. He's saying God is eternal and so are all of us. And we don't have to be confined to these bodies. So this week, we ask you to vote on themes. And the number one theme by far that you all voted for was called Let Go of Thinking for Myself. That got 84 votes. And that is that was way above the other themes. So I had to just keep praying all, all Easter week, let go of thinking for myself. And I know some of you get a feeling of what that means, let go of thinking for myself. But I thought, wow, we need a movie that really shows us how to let go of thinking for ourselves. And some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, I thought that was good. I, I was raised by my parents to think for myself. My professors and my teachers in school said, remember, you need to think for yourself. Um, you don't want other people making decisions for you. And, you know, some people, professors told me, David, you know, when I was in university, they said, you know, the most important thing you'll ever get out of a university is, I said, what? critical thinking. Critical thinking? You mean I'm in university for 10 years to learn critical thinking? They said, yes. Learn how to think for yourself. Well, I'm telling you now, I'm this body is 64 years old, and we're going to use today to let go of critical thinking. <laughs> we're going to learn about faith. We're going to learn about, today I will make no decisions by myself. We're going to learn how to pray the prayer, Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. Who wants to make decisions as a person when instead your heart, your mind could pray, Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. Take me to the correction. Resurrect my mind. Lift me out of this perception of time and space and take me into eternity. I am going to remember God. I'm going to remember eternity. And I'm just, I am glowing with that thought today. I can't think of a better way for us to spend a Saturday than to rejoice together in the remembrance of our Creator and the remembrance of our true self, our Christ self. So first of all, on Easter, we're going to dispel all of history. Uh, Jesus is basically saying, listen, don't, don't cling to the cross, but don't cling to the man Jesus. Don't cling to the, the apostles, Mary Magdalene, all the stories you've heard. No, today we want to be lifted into a state of mind that's beyond all stories, even the Easter story. We have to forgive the Easter story because it's a nice story and it's a powerful story. And we thank the Holy Spirit for giving us that story, because we wanted a happy story. Anybody want a happy story? I, I think the resurrection was just a little story, but it was pointing towards a happy story. But remember, we're a mind who's dreaming this world. And what Jesus says, happy, happy dream, dreams come true, not because they're dreams, but because they're happy. We're told by Jesus, you just need to reach a happy state of mind where you see the dream from a happy perspective. It's the Holy Spirit's perspective, and then you can wake up. So our only function is to know God's will for perfect happiness. Well, I can tell you now, it's just in this moment. You will never find it in the future. You'll never find it in the past. I like an experience where I'm shown that I am to let go of thinking for myself. So I did ask Jesus today, I said, what's the best way I can talk about this? What's the best way, I, this is the theme, let go of thinking for myself. What's, 
what's the best way I can talk about this? And he said, well, you talk about it all the time, no private thoughts. And I said, well, tell me about private thoughts. He said, every thought that you think about the past and every thought you think about the future is a private thought. Because God didn't create linear time, God doesn't even know about linear time, and God only knows you in the present, the I am present. That's, that's where the Christ is. The Christ is the I am presence. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He was, he was talking about the Christ presence. He, he didn't say, before Jesus was, I am, because that would have freaked, it already freaked the people out. The Jewish people were angry ready to throw rocks at him when, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. But he could have just as easily said, before Yeshua was, I am. I am the eternal spirit before time seemed to come, to cover it over. Before the veil of darkness covered over the eternal present and over, covered over eternity, I am that presence. And that presence is what heals. So, you know, you can now forgive Jesus the man, you can forgive the apostles, you can forgive Mary Magdala, you can forgive Mother Mary, you can forgive the whole story. Forgive Jerusalem, let's forgive Galilee, let's for, forgive Judea, let's, let's, let's forgive it all, let's forgive the whole story. Because what he's saying is, you are the Christ right now. And you've always been the Christ. You will never not be the Christ. You, you were created by God to be the Christ, no matter what you can do. You can put on a flesh suit if you want. But Jesus says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of eternity will remain eternal forever. And that which is born of linear time flesh will be flesh. And that's wrong perception. That's private thoughts. So what, you know, I just thought, you know, people say, you know, you always talk about David, no private thoughts, no people pleasing. And this movie is definitely a no private thoughts, no people pleasing movie. But sometimes people will say that are course students and course teachers, they would say, you know, does, does Jesus even talk about that in the course? Or are you just kind of making up your own words? Because I know people do like to make up things with the course, but I just decided before today's movie, I would do just a little, uh, I, I just went to my search, my, my search uh, on my phone, and I just typed in no private thoughts at the top. And I just thought, well, Jesus, what do you have to say from the Course about no private thoughts? So this is, this is what he has to say. In chapter 15, he starts talking about the holy instant. And then in the middle of talking about the holy instant, he says, here there is no concealment and no private thoughts. So he's saying the holy instant, which is how we reach God, we remember God in the holy instant, the present moment. Here there is no concealment and no private thoughts. Then in workbook, on the beginning of the, the workbook, he it's chapter, it's a workbook lesson 19, he says, yet it is a fact that there are no private thoughts. Then in workbook lesson 52, he says, I have no private thoughts. And then in workbook lesson 54, he says, if I have no private thoughts, I cannot see a private world. Okay. One, two, three, four, four references from Jesus telling us that we're seeing a private world and the private hallucination that we see through the ego's darkened lens, it can't be shared. It's, a, it's our own private perceptual hallucination of a world that doesn't exist. And we don't have to worry about correcting behaviors or telling people how they should be, behave differently or they should have acted differently. They should have treat me right. Dun, dun, dun. We don't have to keep playing those songs in our mind because it's a private world generated from private thoughts. 
and and God doesn't have any private thoughts, and neither does Christ. God doesn't even know what a private thought is. Even the word revelation, God is pure love, so God wants to reveal pure love, where everything is shared. Wouldn't you rather have an experience where everything's shared instead of possession? Who owns what? Oh, is that my fork or is that your fork? Is that my spoon or your spoon? I'll clean my spoon, but you clean your spoon. You know, my house, my bank account, my body, you know, my, my partner, my cat, my whatever, my country, fill in the blank. Listen, in the, in the words of the great poet Linda Ronstadt, Love is a rose, but you better not pick it. Only grows when it's on the vine. Handful of thorns, and you know you've missed it. Lose your love when you say the word mine. <laughs> what does the little child say when the child's first learning to speak? Mine. <laughs> That's the ego asserting itself. But we don't have any private thoughts. And if there are no private thoughts, that means there are no secrets. If you're trying to conceal something, it's just because you believe it happened, you believe it's real, you believe it's private, and you believe you can protect it by hiding it and concealing it. Uh-huh, that's the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind believes there's a hiding place for private thoughts. And what does Jesus tell us in the Course? He says, health is inner peace. He says, all illness is mental illness. Take that one in. All illness is mental illness. All death is mental illness. All conflict is mental illness. All war is mental illness. We know this is true. We know Jesus has given us the direct truth. He's not messing around. You know, oh, I feel guilty. I think I should be supporting somebody, some side in the war. Jesus is like, for Christ's sake, you think God created war? Do you really believe God, God created war? Did God create famine? Did God create conflict? Did God create drama? Why would a God of pure love create any of those things? That's a misperception. And he's now today he's going to tell us that it's a misperception based on the belief in private thoughts. Why would God create private thoughts? Why would God of eternity create secrets? Who, who thinks that a secret can be the truth? I don't. I don't think a secret can be the truth. I, I like the words transparent. People say, David, be authentic. Well, how do you be authentic? Be transparent. Don't hide anything. Don't hide anything. I have, I'm practicing that with my cat the cat, the cat in the house, I can't even call it my cat, but the, we just had the eye-gazing look, <laughs> and it's like, isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it is wonderful, but there's no hiding, no secrets in that relationship. It, I, I could not continue another moment if I believed in, in secrets. Now, some of you have been following along our Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment, and I see there's Laverne. Hi, Laverne. Laverne helped develop this beautiful thing along with many others. Laverne's joining us today. And Laverne can tell you, if you talk to Laverne, Laverne will say, we have many good looper movies. We've got a lot of time movies. We've got repeaters. We've got Groundhog Day. Anybody remember Groundhog Day with Phil? We've got Groundhog Day. We have uh, we have Butterfly Effect 1, we have Butterfly Effect 2, we have a movie called Looper. People may think we're a little loopy, but we've got a lot of Looper movies uh, in there. And now Jesus is saying, since this is Resurrection Weekend, Jesus is saying, I'm glad you enjoy my Looper movies that I've given you to help wake up, because they help show you the mistake that you're making. And the only mistake you're making is you're trying to hold on to the past. And when you try to hold on to the past, you repeat it and you don't let it go. But Jesus wants us to forgive the past and recognize that it's already gone. When we try to loop it, 
we're trying to keep it going. And Jesus is like, you're not going to wake up if you keep looping time. Because the ego is time. It's the belief in separation. So if you keep making the same mistake in the present moment and, and not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, if you keep listening to your own past learning, you're going nowhere. You're just going to stay stuck in the illusion of time. But if you follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you're going to get happier and happier, and you're going to be like me. You're just going to scrape me off the ceiling, scrape me off the ceiling. You know, it's just you have a happy, happy, happy life because your dream becomes happy because you don't feel at the mercy of the dream anymore. You're dreaming it. You're not at the mercy of the dream. You're the dreamer of the dream. That's the whole point of the course, to show you you're the dreamer. So, so out of all those Looper movies, Jesus picked one Looper movie for us today because he wants us not to focus on the error, but he wants us to escape. He's giving us this Looper movie today with commentary and setup for the sole purpose of escaping linear time. Today, if you follow along with what I'm sharing, you will escape karma. You will experience what John Lennon called instant karma, which is the present moment, which is that everything is simultaneous. Blanca, you're watching. Blanca's been writing to me a lot. She's saying, it's a bad dream. I'm having a bad dream. I'm having a terrible dream, a nightmare. But today, Blanca, that's why I invited you to come, because today we go from bad dreams into happiness. We will escape the bad dream today. And, and this movie is the best. This is the best movie. This is, this is one of the most spectacular movies ever made in all of history, because it takes you from the loop, and then it lifts you up into the resurrection. It lifts you up above the loop. It takes you beyond the loop. This movie, that's why it's a, it's like Pete said, it's a, it's a classic. This is the, this is a device designed to take you beyond time and space. And that is what we have to do. We need to think differently. Every time we're thinking like a, like a human being and we're trying to plan the future, we're trying to say, oh, this is the way I just am, I make these mistakes. I, I just read a, an article this morning where this actress, famous actress, she says, I'm in therapy and I'm learning to forgive all my past mistakes. Wow, that's the greatest thing. That's better than any acclaim you can get in the world, learning to forgive all my past mistakes. Because when you forgive all your past mistakes, you place the future in the hands of God, and you start to forgive all your future mistakes too, because they're the same. It's a trick. As long as you keep believing in the error, you will seem to repeat the same mistakes. Like in Groundhog Day, you keep stepping into the puddle. You keep falling, falling into the puddle until you stop and jump over the puddle. That's what the movie is about today. Okay, here's our second theme, seeing the impossibility of loss. Isn't that spectacular? That's your second most desired theme, seeing the impossibility of loss. I'm talking about loss of your health in terms of the body. You can see the impossibility of that. I'm talking about loss of your vitality. You can see the impossibility. Loss of money, loss of finances loss of relationships, loss of your parents, loss of your culture, loss of your country, seeing the impossibility of loss. Of course, that has to be part of our awakening, because why would the God of abundance and love create loss? That makes no sense at all. That must be an ego invention, because why would eternal love, oh, what should I do? I think I'm going to invent loss. That makes no sense at all. Why would eternal love invent loss? It's, it's an ego construct. But we all know from heartbreak, we've all had heartbreak in our perceptions of this world. And I would say we have a, we have an, a perceptual problem based on a faulty interpretation that's based on fear and guilt and, and loss. That's where our problems came in. 
it was our own interpretation. We can't blame our parents. We can't blame the country. We can't blame the politicians. It was our own faulty interpretation. And guess what that interpretation was based on? Private thoughts. That's right. We still believe in private thoughts. Uh, I remember Resta one time, she, she would receive these songs from the angels and then she would start to tell me about the song and sing it to me and then she would burst into laughter. And one of the times she was trying to sing this song from the angels that she received and the lyrics go, I, I take my guilt in small doses. Six billion bodies give a little to each. And then she burst into laughter. You see, that's from the angels. I take my guilt in small doses. Six billion bodies give a little to each. The ego peopled this world. So every time we have a grievance with a friend, a coworker, with a, a partner, with a, a dog or a cat, with the environment, with the country, with a politician, that's just an ego attempt to project the guilt of private thoughts off onto a person and say to that person, I would love you if you behave differently. Jesus is like, stop that. You put that there. <laughs> get, the, get the beam out of your own eye before you get the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't go trying to correct people. Don't go telling people they're wrong. Don't go telling people the world would be a better place if they just learn to behave differently. The mind put them there because the ego put the guilt into the world to fool you to think that it's outside of you, but it's not. Okay, let's look at the third one. Invite spirit to overlook the error. Oh my. That's got to be the best invitation. That's better than an invitation to a birthday party, a wedding. <laughs> better, better than an Easter egg hunt is invite the Holy Spirit to overlook the error. That's what I love about today. Today's movie is not about just a looping movie. Oh, no, no. The main character is being invited to overlook the error entirely. And what does Jesus say about this? He says, well, the last, the last illusion to be overcome will be death. The, the last illusion that you will face in your mind is the belief in death. Now, of course, why would eternal love, a, a God of eternal love, create death? I can think of a few better creations than death. <laughs> death. That's right, death doesn't feel good. Death feels like an ending. Death feels like a break in communication. So the main character today, she's going all the way to face her fear of death, to face her fear of loss, and to finally realize that it's not true. Oh, only way you see that death isn't true is if you let yourself be lifted up to overlook the error. Because the Holy Spirit knows that death isn't true, and Jesus knows that death isn't true. But that's why we're watching this movie today, so we can join with the Christ. We can join with the Holy Spirit and see the impossibility of death. And then you laugh. That's when it becomes a, a comedy. But as long as you think death is real, this is not that, this is not a funny world. <laughs> this is. It's not a funny dream if you think death is real. I mean, death is real for anyone. If death was real for anyone, it would not be a happy place, but it is when it's retranslated. Okay, here's release the belief in competition and recognize true equality. How can we know we're all equal until we, we correct this belief in private thoughts, and we correct this belief in linear time. The reason equality seems to be so difficult to face every day on the planet is because of the belief that time is linear and that private thoughts are real. How can you have equality 
if you have secrets? How could you have equality when you can have deceptions? How, how could you have connection feeling that will be so consistent and never go away if you believe that private thoughts are true? Which is just saying if you believe in secrets. So, so basically those are some of the themes that we're going to be dealing with. Now, since this is a setup, I'm going to get you into the movie before you get into the movie. So I want you to know the characters. I want you to know what they're dealing with because they're just showing us what we have to release. If you identify with any of the characters of this movie, it's because they're just showing you the issue that you haven't faced yet. So. You know, you don't have to play this out over many years and decades. If you can, you can do it in this movie if you really see that they're just reflecting your belief in private thoughts. So what we have is it's a movie that's got four girlfriends. Samantha is one, Lindsay, Ali, and Elodie. Uh, those are four girlfriends. They're classmates. They like to hang together. They're, they're besties. They, they like to do things together. They practice releasing their private thoughts about their boyfriends, about their teachers, about their parents. Now let's, let's see, why is this so helpful to us? Because why? I think we could escape all of time and space if we could get into the mind of a teenager. <laughs> Anybody remember when you were a teenager? 13, 14, 15, wasn't that bizarre? Aren't you glad you survived it? How did any of us make it through high school? That was a miracle. <laughs> that, was a, that was an absolute miracle to make it through high school. But imagine if you could go inside the mind of a teenager and then come out the other end and see that that mind of the teenager was your own belief in private thoughts the things that made it so difficult. Let's admit, weren't relationships extremely difficult when we were teenagers? For most of us, you know, maybe they still seem to be, but when you're teenagers, everything's exaggerated. Your hormones are coming into play. You, you don't know what you're gonna do with your life. You hate school. Most of us hated school. Some of us kind of liked it, but, but deep down we were like, I would rather sit home with the popcorn and watch movies <laughs> than, than be hearing a bell go off and moving around like cattle, you know, from first bell, second bell, third bell. Come on, you admit it now. Maybe it was somewhat fun, but you didn't like that structure, right? As a teenager, you didn't, nobody liked the structure. And then if you have a little bit of fun and you get a detention, you have to stay later in the day because you goofed off. <laughs> you didn't play by the rules. I had some fun when I was a teenager because my mother was a teacher in the school where I was going. So I was trying to be goody, goody David, goody, goody David, first bell, second bell, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then my, my friends were telling, talking about my mother who gave them a detention, why did your mother keep me after school? Your mother is mean. Your mother is authoritarian. And I'm like, give me a break. I'm just trying to survive. I'm a teenager trying to make it through the day. And now you're heaping all this mom stuff on me because she was a teacher at the school. So I got a double fast acceleration in forgiveness. <laughs> try, try having your mom at school. Oh, the teachers say, oh, I love your mom so much, but why do, why do you do this, David? Am, am I going to have to tell your mom? Oh, please, this is a nightmare. This is, this is a nightmare. But see, that was a fast acceleration in forgiveness. So in this movie, we have four young women that are, that are best friends. They go to the same school, they, they, they share all their emotions and their thoughts with each other. They do slumber parties together and they have a tendency to gossip. 
as anybody remember when we were teenagers, we really, we gossiped a lot. You know, we were, <laughs> we would get together with our friends and we would gossip. Listen, gossip is private thoughts. We were not sharing the truth. Gossip, stereotypes, putting people down, um, comparing ourselves to other people. We did a lot of that in, in the teen years. And it was just a, it was a private thoughts fest, festival. The wonder we were messed up when we were teenagers. And even now when we have A Course in Miracles, we may still, if you believe in time or death, you still feel a little messed up. Let's be honest, you know, that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. We're still dealing with the remnants of people pleasing and private thoughts. There was a lot of people pleasing going on and these four, these four girls have a lot of people pleasing going on, but they don't know it. We, they didn't know any better. We didn't know any better. None of us knew any better. We just did the best that we could. We were just trying to survive. We were trying to make it out of teenage years and, and hopefully hoping that there would be a tomorrow. But in this movie, they are dealing with a lot of intense anxiety, fear, um, grief. And so, these are the four girls, and the and the main character, her name is Samantha. Now, Samantha has a boyfriend, and his name is Rob, and Rob's a popular guy, you know, he's an athlete, and he's like the guy that people want to, to date, you know, he's one of the real popular guys, and so she thinks she's got the best teenage life she can have because she has a boyfriend. Remember, there was a lot of us as teens who did not have boyfriends and girlfriends. I was one that was voted most quiet. I did not have a girlfriend. Now, the main character here, Samantha, she's got a boyfriend, but she doesn't know what she's going to do with her life. She's dealing with all of her emotions, and she's trying to work through it. And so are her, her, uh, her friends, her besties. Now, there's another boy who likes who likes Samantha, and his name is Kent, you know, like Clark Kent, Superman, Clark Kent. Kent, Kent likes Samantha, and they've known each other since they were children, little children. But when she grew up, she decided to be go with the popular girls and have the popular boyfriend, and this dear, dear friend who loves her dearly, is she doesn't have the time of day for him. She, she doesn't even care about Kent now. Kent was like this dear friend and they shared all these beautiful experiences, but he's, he's not on the A list anymore. In fact, he's not on the B list. He's, he's off the list. <laughs> even though he still adores her, he's not even in her radar. And then we have another woman named Juliet, who she's an artist and she wears her hair long and, and uh, they, they're constantly gossiping, putting her down and everything. But she also was a, the best friend of one of the, of the, the four. Uh, and that's, she's been outcast. She's like now a total outcast. Were any of you outcast in, uh, in your teen years? I think I kind of was because I didn't talk to anybody. I think that was, the, they, they didn't, I, I was like, leave him alone because he's just so quiet. I was contemplating, what's it all about? That's, I think I spent my entire teen years pondering, what is this crazy world about? Will I ever be able to fit into such a crazy world? That's what I was doing during my teen years, but I, I wasn't popular. I was very quiet. I was like a, a, I was like the thinker. I was the thinker. I was trying to figure out <laughs> what's it all about. I was thinking, well, it'd be great to have a girlfriend, it'd be great to have sex, it'd be great to go to parties. But what is the purpose of this world? <laughs> I still had the same private thoughts as everybody, but I was like, what's the point? Though? What, what is the point of this whole thing? So our main character, she's She's not really philosophical to begin with, but once her day, once she seems to die in a car crash, once she starts to have a looping day, like, like in Groundhog Day, 
she starts to ponder what is the meaning of life. Imagine if your day just kept repeating. It's her February 12th. Her February 12th just starts repeating. And she doesn't know why. Uh, and, and that's what the same with all the Looper movies. The, the main character in the Looper movie doesn't know, why is this happening to me? Why don't I get it tomorrow? Why, why am I repeating the same old day? I would say this is the whole human race. We're all just repeating the same mistake. We may tell ourselves, oh, a brand new day. <laughs> but we brush our teeth. Ha <laughs> ha. We comb our hair. If you've got any hair left to comb, you comb your hair. Uh, you know, you you may make a cup of coffee or tea or do something. It's pretty repetitive. It's, it's really Groundhog Day. It's, it's the looping thing. But we're pretty philosophical because we're with Jesus in A Course in Miracles, and we're actually asking the question, what's it all about? What is the purpose for this world? What is the purpose for my relationships? What is the point? Jesus, if you don't mind, I have one question for you. What is the point of the human race? What is the point of time and space? And Jesus says, well, it's the present moment is the point. It's this moment is simultaneous, and now we have Doctor Strange and talking about the, the multiverse. And then the, the movie I just mentioned to you, yeah, everything, everywhere, all at once. If you got to go see the movie, that's quantum. That's basically saying that everything we experience, we're experiencing it, but it's actually simultaneous. That all the, the seeming anomalies of what we could do in that they call parallel universes or multi-universes, they're all happening at the same time. Does that sound like that'll blow your mind? And, and I hope this movie blows your mind. I hope you, you go at the end of this movie, oh my gosh, I was wrong about everything. I was wrong about time. I was wrong about time. That's what this movie can help you do, is you can realize. And I will say that you will be indescribably happy if you realize that time is simultaneous, because it's only the belief that time is linear, which comes from private thoughts and secrets, that makes the world into like a hellish place, makes it, a, it makes it, a, Bianca, you're with me, right? That this, that's why you're, it's such a bad dream, is because it's a linear dream. A dream in which your husband can leave or go off with another woman and all these things. Don't think God has anything to do with that. Don't think Jesus uh, planned that. He's, he wants you to be happy. <laughs> but it requires that we have to let go of our time ideas because we thought something was missing in the past. We thought we took a, take an action to correct it. And we hope for a better future. And Jesus is saying, don't hope for a better future. I've got a present moment for you that you're going to love. But I'll tell you one thing, the future is a trick. I can tell you. And I this is coming from somebody who was in university for 10 years and has a five-year degree in planning. What a joke. Jesus has me get a five-year degree in planning. And then he says, and by the way, you can forget all that now. Oh my, that's right. He's just saying, yeah, forget your career. I know a lot of people are saying, you know, well, it's important to have a career. Let's talk about that for a second. Your career is healing the mind. Your Jesus says this in the Course, your vocation is healing. And you have no other. I don't care what the body seems to do to get some little currency or some paper strips or some metal disc. I'm not talking about that kind of a career. No, Jesus is saying, honestly, your career is, your vocation is, is healing the mind. Because remember, Jesus says, only the mind can believe it's sick. Jesus never really addresses sick bodies, because why? Sick bodies are a projection. Jesus, when, when Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, was he concerned about symptoms? Oh, no. The lame, oh, could suddenly walk. The blind, oh, 
could suddenly see instantaneously. That all they had to do is go near Jesus and, and say, I love you, I trust you, please, I want to be healed, and they were healed instantaneously. He didn't, he wasn't like a doctor, oh, go here, take two aspirin and come back in three days and tell me how you feel. He was like an instantaneous healer because he knew that time was simultaneous and it wasn't linear. He was not tricked by all these forms. He's not interested He's interested in peace of mind. He's interested in, in the kingdom of heaven. So at 12.39 p.m., um, our main character is going to experience a, a car crash. A, 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 I mean, the car is just going to be totally flipped over and, and everything. And then she's going to begin on Cupid Day, on February 12th, called Cupid Day in her high school. She's going to start looping with the same day over and over and over. And she is going to start to wonder what is going on. She's, oh, yes, she freaks out a little bit. Yes, she feels a little rebellious. She starts to get in touch with her unconscious anger. You can imagine if, if your world was suddenly shifted from what you thought it was into something else, you would have a few emotions. She starts to get pretty philosophical in it. Now, before we start the movie, and, I, and again, this is just, wow, what a movie. Just You're just going to love this movie so much. But let's come back to Easter for a moment. If time is not linear, then the whole story of, of Easter has to come down to what does the resurrection mean to me in this moment? And that's what Jesus wants you to do. He wants you to make this Easter different from every other Easter you've ever had. Because just like the crucifixion seemed to be people killing the body of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And just like the resurrection seemed to be when he came, the stone was rolled away and he came back. He came back to the apostles. He made appearances. Uh, he, his body came back. Jesus is saying, now that's just a story. I want you to realize that anytime you are upset, you are believing in the ego, and you are crucifying yourself, and that mind that believes in the ego needs to be saved. It needs salvation. We, that's what the Christians have been talking about, right? <laughs> it's, salvation, you need to be saved. Not a saved person, not a saved body, a saved mind, a mind that realizes it was completely mistaken about linear time, it was completely mistaken about this repetition game, this loop. You have to admit you, you made a mistake believing in the loop. You can't expect the loop to disappear if you still want it there. Why, why would Holy Spirit take it away if you still want it? If you still find something attractive in the loop, the Holy Spirit will wait. If you still find something you want to pursue in the loop, the Holy Spirit will wait. But if you want to experience the resurrection that Jesus was the example of, then you need to devote your heart and your soul to this forgiveness experience. Not forgiving something that happened, but just forgiving the entire loop. The entire loop. You see how important that is? If we're not forgiving the past only, we're forgiving the future too. And I tell you, you will be indescribably happy when you forgive the future. <laughs> we did a whole, whole retreat on that recently. I, I placed the future in the hands of God. It will be in, indescribable happiness if you let go of this loop. And this movie is going all the way. She, the main character, she's going to, she's going to show us all how to do it. She's She's going to face her worst nightmare. She's going to face her fear of death. She's going to face her fear of, of existence. 
in this movie. She's going to face it all for all of us to show us that, of course, that's that's how it, it has to go. And I just want you to pay attention to your emotions as we watch this movie, because that's always the, the way that you get in touch with what's underneath. Don't try to censor your emotions. Don't try to be metaphysically correct. Just allow yourself to be able to watch this movie and go through the emotions and go through everything that, that you feel, but be willing to give it over to Jesus as an Easter present. We're not going to give Jesus eggs, <laughs> Easter eggs. We're going to give over our private thoughts. We're going to give over all of our private thoughts and private beliefs as our gift so that we can accept the resurrection for ourselves. That's all Jesus wants. He doesn't want you to try to behave like a good Christian. He wants you to have pure of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, he said, for they shall see God. Because everything that comes from us, our actions, are all just, what are we truly inspired by? We are no longer going to focus on the error. We are going to focus on the joy. The joy that is ours, that is real, that is true. I don't know how I made it through uh, my teenage years. I think the only way I made it was music. Somehow, no girlfriend, <laughs> Not many friends. I had a very good dog, but I have to say, Jesus reached me with love songs. I had a lot of love songs that I listened to most of my teen years. And now I see that really my love song was for God. Now I see that that's what I always was longing for. I wasn't longing for a physical relationship. I was longing to remember my creator. I was longing to remember my identity as the Christ. And, and that's why I was singing. You know, I would, I would sit there and put my headset on, stylistics. Bet you by golly well. You're the one that I've been waiting for forever. And ever shelves will my love for you keep growing strong, keep growing strong. I mean, my heart would explode open with these love songs. Write your name across the sky. Anything you ask, I'll try, cause betcha by golly, wow. You know, I mean, when I was hearing these love songs, I was starting to connect with my creator. I was starting to connect with the God of love that's beyond time and space, that would never have anyone suffer, that would never turn anyone away. And I was, even in my own way, I mean, I was going to church, but I didn't feel <laughs> the connection quite so strong as the love songs when I'm, my, I'm in my room. <laughs> my heart is opening wider and wider, you know. And, and that's what I want you to feel today. I want you to let yourself go into an experience of how much God loves you, that literally will transport your awareness to a state of oneness and love. You could not ask for anything more than that. Everybody is searching for the love, but it's inside of them. It's not, it's not outside. We aren't going to find it in the right form. We have to let go of pursuing it in the forms. So, Sit back, enjoy this movie. It's probably the best Looper movie ever made because it goes for the resurrection, and that's transcending the loop. Uh, nobody wants to be stuck in a loop forever. <laughs> you can't. We want, we want beyond. We want to go beyond. And this movie is, is going to be used by Jesus today to take us 
soaring, soaring, high, high. Blanca, that's right. No more unhappy dreams. We're going soaring today. <laughs> We're going into the light. <laughs> okay. So enjoy. Enjoy the movie, and I'll be with you during the movie. Okay, there you go. This is a perfect example. Um, when we come to this world, and the only way we even seem to come to this world is by believing the ego. I mean, you... God doesn't send us into chaos. God doesn't even know about chaos. God is just heaven in perfect love and oneness. But if you believe in the ego, you believe in separation from the creator, and then it plays out into fantasies. It plays out into preferences. Uh, this group, these four young ladies that are classmates is just... And they're teenagers, they're just showing us the human condition, right? Um, the main character, Samantha, right before I paused the movie, that was Rob, her popular boyfriend showing up, right? Why, why do we need popularity? God created us perfect. Why is it important to be a popular body? You know, the mind can't be popular because it's, it's all that there is. The mind is everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, to use the movie I just got excited about <laughs> this week. <laughs> Anytime you start getting too sad about something, just remember that who you are is everything, everywhere, and all at once. How sad can you be if you remember that one fact? Because Mind is universal. It cannot be contained. But if you believe in the ego, you start with a body identification, then you want to have a popular boyfriend, you want to have pop, you want to be popular in the class. And even with this little clique of these four besties together, they are talking. And here, Ali uh, speaks up and she says, I, I saw this YouTube documentary. And she starts describing the butterfly effect, how everything that we perceive is connected to everything else that we perceive. She starts talking quantum physics with her girlfriends and they're, they're sitting there and the boyfriend comes over and Lindsay basically shuts her down, says, yeah, yeah, the boring, boring, we're not gonna sit and watch some boring documentary, but." She's talking quantum physics. She's talking about everything is connected. Right there at the table, she's talking quantum physics. She's talking about her interest in the quantum field. Now, Ali comes from a very wealthy family. Wait till you see the size of the house that Ali lives in. Ali lives in a mega mansion, uh, and yet she likes to stay home uh, they're, her girlfriends are saying, don't even bring up Matt. You cried for a whole week in your sweatpants and got your sweatpants dirty. Don't even bring that guy up again. He, you're with your babes now. You're with your besties. We're with each other till death do we part, even beyond. You know, you see how the construct now is the besties. Now the, the besties are important and the boyfriends are important. And the Popularity is important. None of this is real. None of this is real. This is, this is fantasy. This is a figment of imagination. None of it has anything to do with reality, which is pure love and oneness. Now, what I want you to notice is when they start to gossip, they will start to put people down. There's this woman, Juliet. Um, they... They love to put Juliet down because it makes them feel better. They're so grateful that they're popular and that Juliet is a freak. <laughs> you know, they constantly are putting her down like she is different than them and they're better and she's worse. This is how, remember when we were in high school, this is what we did, right? You know, when we had our yearbooks and best friends and close friends and, you know, the ones we were related to, we liked, and then the ones we didn't like. You see, that's all ego. That has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. 
these are preferences for the world of form to be a certain way so that you'll feel better about yourself as a body, better about yourself as a personality. Why be popular except you want to be a more popular body? Why try to form relationships except you feel there's something lacking, you have some kind of unworthiness or lack in your mind? And now you're looking to form, to overcompensate for that sadness you feel. When we were teenagers, yes, we felt lonely. We didn't know what to do with that intense loneliness. Did we feel bored? Did any of you ever feel bored as a teenager? Me too. I was bored out of my gourd. I was bored, bored silly. That's why we, we distracted ourselves with so many things. Some of us got into trouble. Some of us avoided getting into <laughs> trouble. Some of us were goody two-shoes. Some of us were wicked. <laughs> Jesus is like, it's all an illusion. I don't care if you perceive yourself as wicked or goody two-shoes. <laughs> You're not a body and you never were a body. You never were a person and you never were a personality. You're having a dream of separation. You're hallucinating with the figments of your imagination, all of your ego beliefs and preferences. So the things that you think you get, that you want, the ego goes, mm, good, good. And then it doesn't last. You have a boyfriend, you have a girlfriend, the love doesn't last. You have, you, you're the class valedictorian, you, you're very smart, you're, you're, you're considered a nerd, but you're very, very smart. So you've learned a bunch of artificial intelligence that has nothing with, to do with your value as a spirit. Nothing. Nothing you've ever learned in time and space has any value whatsoever in contrast with your eternal spirit. So here they are, they're talking, they're talking, and, and all of their conversations are basically mostly centering on, on how to overcome their feelings of unworthiness using form. And here comes Ali, the one who comes from a very rich family, who is diagnosed as attention deficit disorder, ADD. And she's the one that's interested in the YouTube uh, on quantum physics. Aha! Uh -huh. I wonder why she has ADD. Yeah, maybe she's, maybe that's actually part of her being yearning for some true meaning, something that will last forever not something that's temporary, some, some true value and meaning in her life, which is spirit. So let's watch them as they go along. We can learn a lot by watching these teenagers because they are acting out the ego beliefs and preferences in a very extreme way. They're insecure, they're anxious, they're fearful, they're judgmental, they're always comparing. <laughs> How many roses did you get for Cupid Day? 22. Oh, I hope I get 15. I'm aiming for 15. Oh, I got 12 roses from Matt. You see, all the comparisons. Who got the most roses? Who's loved the most? What do roses have to do with divine eternal love, I ask you? Really, let's be honest, you know. Who cares if you get three bouquets of roses if you still feel lonely? You know, what, what does that matter? We're pulling the curtain back on the ego this time, baby. We are taking with Jesus resurrection time. We are not going to be fooled by these tricks anymore. Some of you already are, are saying, yeah, I know. I'm, I've, I've had about enough of it. You know, I've had my fill of illusions. I'm, I'm through with it. But let's let these teenagers really show it to us, really show it, because because we may say these are my best friends now, but what about Kent? What about the guy who adores Samantha, who gave her this two colored rose uh, and he still adores her and she has no time for him? Uh, what about uh, this, this woman that they're going to make fun of, Juliet? They are, are totally dissing her. They are totally putting her down every chance that they get. But maybe there's some hidden thoughts and secrets that haven't been 
brought to the surface yet, and maybe all of time and space is just letting the hidden secrets come to the surface. How else are we going to love everyone if we still have unconscious private thoughts that we're holding on to? And why would we want to keep secrets if God has no secrets? How can we come to know God if we want to hold on to secrets? You know, you need to be able to say and mean, I'm not interested in unconscious uh, beliefs anymore. Just, just put a prayer out during the movie and say, Holy Spirit, I've had enough with these unconscious beliefs. Everything that's going to occur in my dreamscape in this moment, which is the only moment there is, is just designed by you for me to give up unconscious beliefs. Nothing bad has ever happened to me in my life. It was you, God, trying to reach me. It was you, Jesus, trying to lift me up to the kingdom of heaven. While I was det determining from the ego perspective, I had good days, bad days. Things went right, things went wrong. The angels are laughing. The angels are laughing going, it's simultaneous. You, there aren't good things and bad things. You just have an ego belief system that tells you that some things are good, some things are bad. There's not even better and worse. Are we ready to go into a state of mind that sees there's never been better or worse ever? Those are just comparisons and judgments. I'm finished with better and worse. I see you over there waking to love. You're in there with me. You're in there with me. No more comparisons. Not a single comparison. I will not judge anything. Lord, I will not be your critic today. I would see everything the same. I want to see the world the way you see it. I'm not going to judge because that would be a critic of, of the Holy Spirit. The critic of the one who says all things work together for good. The one who says let, let all things be exactly as they are. Ah, oh, there's our spirit. You know that spirit I'm talking about. And the angels are cheering us on saying, come on, you can do this. You can wake up. You don't have to buy this crazy comparison game. Let's learn from the teenagers that we don't have to go through this anymore. Because they're showing us how it's, it's hard. It's hard believing in, in separation. Okay, here we go, back to the film. So here we have a couple besties and in the car as well, talking about an event that for an adolescent girl or an adolescent male is an important event in time and space, and that is losing your virginity. So that's what this whole discussion was, a, a major uh, step. And they were saying tonight she just she moves into discovers her womanhood. So. So it's not enough to just have a self-concept of being a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, but there's all these events in time and space that are supposed to be so important and that people think about a lot and give a lot of meaning to. So let's just look at the whole idea of uh, sexuality and virginity, for example. What this applies to in A Course in Miracles is workbook lesson number two. I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. Uh, virginity, if you go back to virgin, you know, if you look at other meanings of the word virgin, you could look at, at, at pristine. You could look at... Um, some people say undefiled. If you, if you really want to look at a virgin mind, that would be a mind untainted by the ego, a mind that is still aligned with God. Now that's the kind of virgin, this is the kind of virgin that we need to be talking about because everything is mind. Everything is mind and you want a virgin mind, right? You want a virgin mind because that's a mind that's lined with God. I am as God created me. That's a virgin mind. I am still as God created me. That's a virgin mind. Does it so much matter in form whether you have this outcome or that outcome? Well, if 
We'll roll it back from lesson number two to lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. <laughs> Jesus is the master psychologist. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's going to wake you up to eternity. And he's starting off his first two lessons in his workbook are nothing I see means anything. And I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. So for Jesus, all sickness is of the mind. That's the ego belief system. All sickness is of linear time, past, present, and future. The ego invented linear time. There is no sickness in the present moment. There is no death in the present moment. Don't wait around for your body to do something, live or die. We don't have to think like that anymore. What about now? What about now? Who's interested in waking up now? Who's interested in being happy and joyful now? That's what this is all about. It's about right now. Because why? Because time is simultaneous. It's not linear. You're not going to find it if you go fishing in that pond of future or fishing in the pond of the fed. The big fish is now. <laughs> this is it. And the teenagers are showing us as they put down Juliet and they, they call her a freak. She never gets any roses. Juliet never gets any roses. So these four girls send her a, a, a Cupid val valogram two days before Valentine's and basically said, say basically better luck, better luck next, next year, not. Like they're basically writing her a message every year and sending her to her a valogram, basically saying you're a loser. And the message of, of the Instagram is you'll always be a loser. Thank you, teenagers, for acting out the ego so, so strongly. Nothing like a good dose of, of rejection, abandonment, and, and the rest of your life will be, be the same. You know, at least with the teenagers, we see it's not veiled. You know, they are, they are acting out their anger, their specialness. And the idea that they are the four together, they are the besties, that's a, that's a configuration too. That's not the truth. Where's the perfect equality with everyone and everything? Wouldn't you rather have perfect equality with all your brothers and sisters everywhere? And another thing is basically from the start of the movie is Jesus tells us in the course, he says, you cannot judge your advances from your retreats. In other words, even within time and space, when you think things are going good, when you've got your hands like this, you're going, yes, yes, finally, yes. Jesus is going, no. <laughs> you can't judge your advances from your retreat because why? Because you believe in time and space and, and you're, you're in nowhere land, like the Beatles. You know, he's a real nowhere man living in a nowhere land making all his nowhere plans for nobody. That applies to all of us in time and space. Well, there's definitely no way. You think you can discern between what's helpful for you and not without the Holy Spirit's help? No. <laughs> you, you haven't got a clue, Jesus is saying. Now, in this movie, Samantha, basically, she's not interested in Kent at all, even though when she was in grade school, Kent was really close, was like her best friend. But now she's traded that in for her bestie girlfriends and Rob, the popular athletic uh, uh, guy who gets all these roses. So she's traded in for a better model. She's not interested in the childhood bestie. She's, she wants the hunk. She wants to go, I want the hunk. I want the hunk for the boyfriend. But you see, we don't know our best interest. Jesus is sending us exactly who will help us every second of every day. The people that appear in your dreamscape are there for you to release the ego. That's the purpose. That's why they're showing up. You can't love a form, but you can learn to forgive the form and love university, love the Christ. You cannot love a form. You cannot 
cling to a form and think that that will bring you eternal happiness, eternal life. It's a hard lesson for the ego, of course, because the ego says, you know, bollocks, it's no way. It's going to try to specialize every form. So the characters that we see are just sprinkled in our dream to teach us to let go of searching for love and form. That's, that's what the purpose of life. The purpose of this world is to forgive it. And you can't forgive it unless you give up private thoughts, unless you give up the belief in the past and the future. All the great mystics and saints have said live in the present. All the way, I don't care if we're talking Lao Tzu, Confucius, we're talking Abraham, we're talking all, Jesus, and then all the ones through all the centuries and everything, and now even the same, Eckhart Tolle, Byron Katie, Adyashanti, what's everyone saying? It's the same message, live in the present moment. How could we have missed it? My gosh, it's been there going on for centuries, live in the present moment. But the ego is like, no, 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 play around with time and space, past and future, because that way you'll stay depressed. And if you're depressed, you'll be guilty. And if you're guilty, the ego can say, you're still mine. You see, you can't let this puff of nothingness take over your mind. Jesus won't have it, you know, he, he wants you to know the light. And God wants you so much to know the light that God's will for you is perfect happiness. Every time you get upset or sad, just think, wow, this trying to go against God's will for perfect happiness, this is killing me. And, and that's what linear time does. It tries to take all the life out of you. It tries to eliminate the joy, eliminate the glee, eliminate the happiness. That's what the ego is trying to do. Don't fall for it. Okay, here we go. Let's see where our teenagers, they're showing us. These teenagers are doing, bravo, Academy Award. This is Oscar for acting out the ego. This is Oscar material. Here we go. Thank you, teenagers, showing us the human condition. Judge school is so boring. Judge the world, parents and everything else, and then escape to what? Party time. Drunk, sex, drugs. It's, it's an attempt to go unconscious, literally, because of the pain of the world. Parties, you remember back to the teenage years, how important parties were, that's escapism. Let's talk about it honestly from a spiritual perspective, that's escapism. Somehow I don't think Yogananda as a, Paramahansa Yogananda as a teenager, I can't see him at this party. No, I can't, I can't visualize Paramahansa Yogananda at this party, why, because as a teenager, he's already seen his guru. He's already about spiritual awakening as if spiritual awakening is the only thing in the universe that's worth pursuing. And aha, no wonder Paramahansa is not unconscious with alcohol, laying around on each other and talking about, you know, blowjobs and, you know, here and, and, uh, we have to say, Samantha, she's our lead character. You know, all the pre-party talk was about this is your big night. You're going to lose your virginity. This is, you're going to pass into womanhood tonight. And she gets there and she finally cut, runs into Rob, her famous, you know, her, her very important uh, popular boyfriend, and he's drunk. And he basically says, text me in an hour. Oh, how romantic. Now that's really romantic. Drunk already, text me in an hour. Give me at least another hour to get a little more drunk. Well, that's a good lead in for losing your virginity, right? You know, this is showing us how bizarre this planet is. This is bizarreville. This has nothing to do with love. Nothing, nada, nada, nada. This has nothing to do with divinity. 
This world is a world that was made by the ego and no wonder they call it a place of temptation, but it's not the things, the people, the places, it's not the alcohol that's the temptation, it's not the drugs, it's not the smoking, it's not the sex. The ego in the mind is the temptation to be something that you're not. You are created as a divine spirit and the entire world that the ego made was to keep you from knowing who you are to keep you from waking up to your divine reality. That's what the whole world was made for. It's not love that makes the world go round, it's the ego's guilt that spins the world, it spins the planets, it spins the, the spheres. This is a trap. Linear time is a trap. And we don't want our mind to get caught in this mouse trap because the ego is the mouse. <laughs> but we don't want to be caught in it. Now, we need contrast experiences. So you have to look at it for a moment from Samantha's private world. She wants to be popular. She wants to date the popular guy. She wants to have the popular friends. And she doesn't realize that she sold out to reality by going for this popularity. When Jesus was here 2000 years ago, I don't think he was so concerned about popularity. With some of the stuff that came out of his mouth, <laughs> basically after three years, there was an angry mob saying crucify him. That's, that's how popular Jesus was. Because why? He was simply here to represent divine truth. He was simply here to represent reality. He was simply here to know who he really was and then extend it and share it and say, this is good news. We have, a, we have a divine creator. We have a divine life in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's very close. He was very joyful and excited. So what we're going to see is, what we're seeing is the attempt to cover over tremendous guilt that even when they're laying there getting drunk, they're saying, oh, I have DDD, ADD and I'm famous and oh, I like to drink and I like this. They're going through their boyfriend, girlfriend issues, but basically underneath the teenager is a lot of sadness. There's a lot of hurt in there, right? And then the, the alcohol, the sex and the drugs is the cover for all that guilt and all that hurt. But, the Holy Spirit is using this right now because here comes our Samantha, our lead character, and she comes in there and she's hoping for a beautiful night with Rob. And already things are going bad. If your boyfriend is drunk and the party's just beginning, uh, I don't think it's going to turn into such a beautiful romantic evening. I don't think it's going to be a moment that you'll cherish and remember. You see, the Holy Spirit has to show through contrast, this is not what you really want. And that's what the Holy Spirit does with all of us. We get to try it out. We try the ego's ways. But sooner or later, we come to a realization, wow, this is not working. I, I don't, I need more than theological doctrine. I need an experience of the present moment. I need to have an experience that everything's simultaneous because this linear stuff is just guilt. If I keep playing the game of linear time, I'm just going to be wallowing in guilt and trying to use anything I can to placate the ego and to try to make it a little better, make it survivable. We're worth more than surviving time and space. We, are, we were created as the Christ <laughs> that's that's how valuable we are. We are the Christ, but if we believe in the ego, you can see it's it's a it's a slow and lingering death. Uh, Jesus talks about in the course, the, it, like someone who stalks you and plots your death, a slow and lingering death. That's what linear time is. If you buy into it, it's a misperception of everything, and and that's where people get talking about pleasures and pains. Well, I had the good life, but then things went wrong. Oh, I had beautiful family, friends, children, house, money, diamond rings. I had it all, and then I lost it. 
bring out the violins. Jesus is like, please, please, please. You, the angels are laughing like, come on, you guys are hallucinating this dream and you are taking everything so seriously. So why all these ups and downs? Why all this drama is because you're just making something serious that isn't serious at all. You know, you need to start to laugh at the whole thing. So here we go. Teenagers, take it away. Show us everything about the human condition so we can let it go in one movie. <laughs> so we have to remember if it's all simultaneous and it's all happening at once, then the problem of seeing the dramas, the conflicts, the emotional clashes are projected from the ego. So if you perceive the conflict in this world, you are perceiving through the ego's lens. I know a lot of you may say, well, you know, I, I turn on the internet or I, I start looking on the internet and, and I'm seeing images of the war going on in uh, Ukraine with uh, Ukraine and Russia. If you really read about all the geopolitical things going on about oil and goods and per economics and all these things, this is all just a projection of the ego. And if you think that that war in Ukraine is bad in your perception, you should go to a teenage party. <laughs> We're seeing all of the dynamics right there in the teenage party. Put downs, uh, beer being thrown at people, screaming physically, attacking uh, people and everything. This, it's the same thing. It's you, that's your choice. If you choose a world of conflict and put your attention and focus on the ego, that's, that's the world you must see. Because the mind is so powerful that the, the mind will draw forth witnesses based on what it believes. So really the question is, are you willing to put your attention in the present moment? Because if you don't put it in the present, if you don't really go with the spirit into the present moment, then that's your alternative. Conflict, war, strife, struggle, you see. And if you do put, put it on the present moment, then I will tell you that you will see the comedy. You will see the comedy. I, I mentioned earlier, that's what's been going on here at the monastery in Easter week. We had a flat tire. Then we, we went to order a replacement tire, and then we saw the car didn't have a spare tire, so we ordered a spare tire. And then it got funnier and funnier. We had tires arriving without us knowing it at the monastery. We had tires coming through the mail. We were inundated <laughs> with tires. Jesus was, was saying, you guys have to see that the present moment is all that there is. If I have to throw a bunch of tires at you guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake you up here. And finally, I, I just took a nap one day. I went to sleep and I got up and I came to my phone and it said, you have one voicemail. And it was this guy saying, oh, our mistake, our guy made a mistake and we accidentally sent you an extra tire voicemail. And I'm like, oh my God, it never ends. And he said, please put a return address label and send it back to us. So the tires all over the place, I just started burst, I just burst into laughter. And I said, Jesus, you are the best. You are the best. You make fun of everything. You make a joke of everything in order for me to, to know you. And here it is Easter week and you are pulling out all the stops with the best comedy act I've ever seen. And you should have seen the look on our faces, you know. We were just laughing so hard. But, but this comes when you start to realize that the only lesson you have to learn is that this moment is everything. That's the only lesson you have to learn. Some of you are concerned about your careers. Listen, one lesson. Some of you are concerned about your futures. Mm -hmm. One lesson. 
Once you start to realize that everything in the world is conspiring to show you that the present moment is all that there is, even this new movie that came out, I looked at on my phone and I said, what, what kind of name is that? Everything, everywhere, all at once. Did you see, that's the name of the movie. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I just couldn't help but laughing. I'm thinking, this is what it's come to. Jesus, it's, it's Easter, he's pulling out all the stops. He takes me to see that movie. He plays a tire game with me. He's like saying, please don't take this world seriously. It is not your father's will for you. It is, it, your will is to be laughing, to be joyful, to be happy. It's like Jesus is saying, what have I got to do to help you see this? <laughs> like it's so much fun. He's so playful. He's just playful, playful, playful all the time, the angels and Jesus. And it's not this solemn kind of thing. I, I still, I mean, uh, this morning, I'm thinking like it's Easter, I'm going to have so much sun with all my friends online today. And, and, and Jesus is like, yeah, it's Easter. Come down, come down from, come down from the cross. There is no sin and your soul is not lost. You have been dreaming a world of sad thoughts. Come down, come down from the cross. You, you got to love it. He's just serenading us. He's serenading us. He's saying, be with me, be with me, see with me. Don't try to interpret the world on your own. Don't try to even think on your own. Think with the Holy Spirit. Merge your mind with the Holy Spirit. That's where the innocence is. That's where the happiness is. That's where the joy. And then when I watched this movie, even last night, just getting, I haven't seen this movie for years. When I watched it, boom, my heart just started exploding open with love. Because again, Jesus was like saying, that's right. I'm here with you, and that's the truth. I am not some historical figure. I'm here now. I'm here now with you now. So here we go. Take it away, teenagers. Let's, let's have some more uh, beautiful witnessing to show us, show us what love is not and help take us into what love is. That's what we want. Now, there's the fatal car crash. Uh, you may have noticed the song that was that was being played. <laughs> Elodie found a song for them to play. They like music. Um, each day is passing by. Each hour is passing by. I can't live without you. I want to get out. That's the lyrics on the song right before this, this car crash up that basically wipes everybody out. Each day is passing by, each hour is passing by. I can't live without you. That's for God. They were smiling. They actually got out of their gossip and the judging, <laughs> judging the, their, the woman at the party. They actually got and started relaxing and laughing and then the song just keeps repeating, I want to get out. I want to get out. You know, that's it. We, we know that there's something more than this world. We know it. We know it in our heart. We know this world was not what we were created for. We know there's a much greater purpose for our life. And at some point, we start to realize we aren't going to find meaning in this perceptual world. It was... It was, it was made up, invented by the ego to cover over meaning. The meaning is who we are. The meaning is the love. The meaning is God. And here, the premonition in the song is, I want to get out. And, and so even that is acted out. <laughs> Maybe I want to get out of this scenario, but I, no, no, I want to get out <laughs> of perception. 
some of you were listening to me a, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, and I was doing a movie talk on Saturday. And um, I was, it was the one, Eyes of Tammy Faye. Some of you are with me for the Eyes of Tammy Faye. But I read this part in the course where Jesus was saying the ultimate realization is that perception is unnecessary. Perception, we're talking about the five senses, unnecessary. Perception of a world of time and space, unnecessary. Oh yeah, some parts of the course he calls it an illusion. You really like it when he throws a different adjective at you. Unnecessary. I want to get out. There's something in our heart that's saying, I want to know my true self. I want to know my creator. And as far as the ego's world, I want to get out. Now, Jesus will tell us, well, actually, you're not in. <laughs> you, you, never, you never got into that. <laughs> That's why Jesus is laughing. You know, even I want to get out. It's like, who is the you that's stuck in time? <laughs> Jesus says in the Course, when I awoke, you were with me. You were with me. We're together. We've always been together. We'll always be together because of our Creator. We are the same one. So even when you say, I want to get out, it must be that you believe that you're in, <laughs> you see? And that's why we're, we need a good loop movie today <laughs> to really help us with this. Because as long as I think I want to get out, that's going to be frustrating, you see? But Jesus is telling us only the one that believes that you're in time and space is, that's the ego. It, and you're not the ego. You never were the ego. You will never have an, an advanced ego or an improved ego. Ego means death wish. Advanced death wish? Jesus says, I don't think so. Improved death wish? Jesus says, I don't think so. Uh, nothing is nothing is nothing. The nada, nada, nada. That is the ego. It's nothing. That's why we have good reason to laugh, because there's nothing to get huff about, nothing to get hung about. <laughs> the Beatles had it right. Strawberry fields forever. There's nothing to get hung about. It's just the belief in the ego that generates the frustration. So now, we're going to see in this movie how our main character, Samantha, now the day will repeat and will repeat. And the only purpose of a repeating day is to show us the impossibility of the error. The only purpose of a repeating day is to show you that you don't want it. <laughs> That, that you, simultaneous, it comes back to the present moment. There's nothing repeating in the present moment. But if you want to try an alternate uh, reality, which is time and space, which is not reality at all, then that's what generates the conflict. That's what the authority problem is. That talk, Jesus talks about in the Course, where he says, God is your author. And when you believe you can make a self different from the spirit reality that God created you as, then that's an authority problem, and that's what the ego is. That's what death is, trying to be the author of yourself. Imagine that you're an eternal being of light, at one with God, and then you somehow think, I can invent myself, and I can keep reinventing myself. I'm going to do you know, male, female, I'm gonna, I like I'm in Africa, let's do, no, no, Russia, no. British Columbia, that's what I'm going to go for. Uh, and you see, it's like the world is a bunch of images, and you're trying to pick which one is best. And, and the angels are laughing, going, ay, ay, ay. Gosh, the, they're all the same. You're just trying to figment of the imagination. So, so Jesus, if that's the case, why do I like that song in Pocahontas so much? Paint with all the colors of the wind. I like to, I want to paint with all the colors of the wind. And Jesus says, well, if you let the Holy Spirit be the painter 
and you let yourself see that this is all simultaneous, then you can paint with all the colors of the wind because you won't be invested in the colors. That's how you paint with all the colors of the wind. That's how you are an expression of, of the present moment in joy is you go ahead, paint with all the colors of the wind, sing with all the voices that you can find, shine your light in all the ways, but just remember, it's all right here, right now. It's all simultaneous. The only fun you're going to have is in this moment. Don't think you're going to find it in the future. If you're not happy now, just admit to yourself, to the Holy Spirit, say, I'm not happy now. What, what crazy private thoughts am I holding on to <laughs> that is preventing me from my joy? You see, that's an honest prayer. What is it that I'm still holding on to that isn't joyful, that isn't happy? That will take you into it. So here we go. Samantha now, she's waking up and she's looking around at the little bird that her that uh, the little one made for her and it's the bird in the bed and she's looking around and now she is going to be taken on a journey to find what is the purpose behind this world? What is the purpose that I'm supposed to see in this world? Because that's, a, now that's a good pursuit. When you, when you try to go for the purpose behind this world, you are in for the most joyful experience of your life. So she's got to do it. She's our lead character here. Here we go. So how beautiful. Now the day repeats. She talks to her girlfriends. She goes to the party. You know, it's the same party. The same things are happening. But now, this time when Rob spills beer on her, her sweater, and starts to kiss her and and is very, very drunk. This time through, you know, she for the first time is starting to say, I need to talk to you. You see how it starts to come back to the communication. Like I'm panicking and I need to talk to you. That's the most basic element of a, of a relationship is the communication. And after she's gone through this, and now she's seeing this whole party again, she's like, she's really starting to wonder what what's going on here underneath. And even though her girlfriend, you know, is, is Lindsay saying, Oh, tonight's the big night, and you don't drink, you don't want to ruin your passage into womanhood and, and all this stuff. When she comes to the actual encounter with drunk Rob spilling beer on her again, something right there is it's something deeper in us that, that knows that we're worth more than this world. We're worth more than these crazy, crazy things that happen to us. And even for her, you know, she wants more of a relationship than somebody who's drunk having sex with her and and saying, well, I'll text you, or, oh, really? You're going to make me wait a whole night? I'm just going to go? You know, she's starting to see, by contrast, that what she wants an answer to, the kind of communications that she's been having are not taking her in the direction of finding the answer that she wants. And that's a good thing. I've had people tell me they've had realizations in their life, mystical experiences, and then their whole world changes. The people that they spend time with, the things that they spend their time in. That happened during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, people used to work in restaurants as, as waiters, waitresses, <laughs> and they, they used to get terrible wages. Tiny minimum wage was just the tiniest thing and doing ridiculous things in these restaurants. And now, after the, a couple of years after the pandemic, I go to drive into one of these restaurants here, and I drive up, and the restaurant's closed, and it says, big sign, now hiring. It's, it's a ghost restaurant. 
And then if I'm on a good day, the drive through is open. <laughs> and <laughs> I could go to drive through Most days, no, it's just a ghost restaurant. Because people, the great resignation, people have said, I, I'm better than these silly little minimum wages doing these things. You know, my life is more important. The pandemic taught me <laughs> that my life is more important than doing meaningless things for almost nothing and pissing away my life. My life is important. I went into a I went into a restaurant maybe a week or two ago and and I, I the door the door was actually open. I went, oh my God, it's 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 not a ghost restaurant. The door is open. So I went in and I looked around. I couldn't see anybody though. Nobody was in there. Do they still eat food? So I looked around and then I went over to the counter and I could see there was something happening back in the kitchen. And I went to the counter and the guy came out and and I said, can I order? And he said, yeah. And he pointed to an electronic queue, electronic menu. And so I, I was like, so I went over there and I was trying to figure out the menu and everything. And finally, I'm pushing, pushing, but trying to order something, which I didn't know how to do. And finally, I did order something. And I said, I went over to him. I said, how do I pay? And he said, card, use a card. We don't accept cash. I've got to figure out how to order on the menu. They don't accept cash. Oh, no, I'm a cash guy. So I, I have to go over. And, OK, so then I get a receipt. And I take it off. It was so much fun. I thought I'm on a new planet now. I, I used to just go in and get a drink and, and something to eat. But Jesus is playing with me now. He's having so much fun. He's like, David, you're going to restaurants that aren't even open anymore. You, 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 your appetite's leaving. I'm going to have to teach you how to live on divine prana because you, you are not doing well in the restaurants now. There, there's no people in there. <laughs> you know? I'm just laughing all the way. I'm like, all right, this is, this is Jesus is going to have fun with all of us because we have to let go of the past. You can't even go into a restaurant and order and pay for some food anymore. Not where I live. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. It's gone. That's an old memory from an ancient past that never happened. <laughs> so this is how Jesus works with us. And this is what's happening here because Samantha, she is now saying to drunk Rob, let's talk. And drunk Rob is not having it. He's like, oh man, now you're going to make me wait. And he's so <laughs> drunk. And, and so now she's like, uh oh, now she's starting to realize that, that things are not what she thought they were. But she's going to have to open to the signs and symbols because Jesus has her. Jesus is right there with her to help her and navigate this thing. And let's see how he does it. How will Jesus reach her at this party? Because she needs help. She's getting a little disoriented. She's, she said, I'm panicking. So she needs some pretty quick, practical help. OK, here we go. Wow. She got to watch the whole scene again. But this time, she's watching. She's watching it. How many wars have we went through on this planet? How many conflicts does it take? How many? perceived clashes in time and space before we actually start to look at our own mind and say, wow, I don't think this war is God's will for me. In fact, I don't think this, this war has anything to do with God's will. And then we start to pause for a moment and we start to look at the world in a very different way. We start to open our mind a little bit, like show me Maybe my perception is the problem. Maybe I've been seeing a false world. Maybe I haven't really been in truth or honesty. Uh, maybe I lost touch with God or something. For me to see repeated war, repeated conflict, repeated clashes, I think we need to look at 
at taking responsibility for our state of mind. You know, Jesus tells us in the Course, I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Wow, now we're starting to get into what going within the inward journey really means. We have to really look at the private thoughts that we have held in our mind that are reflected in this private world. At times it seems like a dark world, a very hellish world, a world where war breaks out, where there's pandemics, you know, where there's, there's earth changes, cataclysms, tsunamis, storms, tornadoes, hurricanes. You know, we, we have to realize, wow, there must be some kind of storm that I have pushed out of awareness that still I believe in. If I'm still getting caught up in the storms of the world, then I must still believe in the storm. And Jesus is telling us, yes, that's, that's why I'm here to help you. <laughs> you. That's why you need mind training. And this is a course in mind training. And this movie is helping us really start to see that even if we start to be aware that we're in a pattern of repetition, that, that the goal and the only purpose of the repetition is for us to let go of all false ideas, all false concepts that we have held in the place of the divine love and truth. So we saw at the beginning, when they first went to the party, we saw it was a big blow up. And then um, Kent, Samantha's childhood friend is like, that's his house, his parents' house. He's like, why, why are you attacking? Why, why throwing beer at her? He doesn't understand what's happening. And, and she's like, don't touch me. And, and he's like looking at her like, I don't even know you. Like, what happened? What happened to our friendship? What happened to our, our relationship? Our, what happened to our connection? Little by little, the Holy Spirit has to start to pull in the, the witnesses to the world that we want to see. So if I'm upset with the world, I have to start to question why do I still want to see the conflict? What am I so afraid of that I would still follow this ego trick and see it as if it's external to my mind when the Course is saying, come, let's look together at the darkness in your mind and let's let it go. Let the Holy Spirit free your mind. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's starting to happen. So, Mom, I think you're beautiful. You know, the reinterpretation is starting. As traumatic as it's been, the love in us is so strong, it can't help but come up and come out. And uh, I think this time, I've watched this movie many times, but this time I'm watching the movie and, and I'm, I'm watching the movie and, and that scene comes on with mom and I'm like, wait a minute, I think I know that actress. I think I know, I rec Jesus, I recognize that actress. What, what movie was she in? And uh, it was, um, it was Jennifer Beals. Uh, take your passion, da, 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 da. flash dance. I'm going, that's Jennifer Beals from flash dance. Oh my God, that's the mom. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah. Here's a message for you, David. Take your passion, da, 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 da. make it happen. Da, 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 da. So then he gives me a little teaching on passion. Listen, he doesn't want us to just pursue our ego passions. That's not helping us. How are ego passions uh, get waking us up from the dream? No, that's how we say, say stuck dreaming. You see, our passion has to be for God. Our passion has to be for true happiness, lasting happiness. We can't go for temporary passions anymore. We have to start to follow Jesus. And he says, I want you to be a miracle worker. 
I want you to be a teacher of God, and I want you to be a demonstration of my love. Wow, that's, that's a passion. That's the passion of the Christ, and I'm not talking Mel Gibson bloody passion. I'm talking, I'm talking a joyful passion where people see you and they feel your joy, they feel your happiness, and they feel the love of God that radiates and emanates from you to everyone and everything. Like I'm saying, everything, everywhere, and all at once. That's That movie has really hit me this week, but just the title of that movie I got excited about because that's what we can be honestly passionate about. When you let your passion of mind get misdirected through ego purposes, all it is is pride and pleasure and attack. Um, people say, well, what's, what's pleasureful or what's, uh, what's so good about attack? Well, there are those that, that actually in Ukraine right now that actually are trying to derive pleasure from attack. It's as bizarre as it sounds. But, but the things of the ego will try to reinforce that you're a body. And that's where the pride, pleasure, attack comes in. So when Jesus says the Holy Spirit uses the body only for communication, we have to really take that with sincerity. We have to realize that that's got to be our passion, is to let the Holy Spirit speak, speak through us, laugh through us, smile through us, hug through us. Let's, let's let the Holy Spirit have, the, have its way with the puppet. Let's not try to be autonomous puppets anymore. No more Pinocchio. No more trying to be real men and women. That's enough of that game. That game is over now. Now we're here to inspire joy. We're here to inspire happiness. That's how you wake up. You, you allow yourself to be given in service to God. I'm not talking about some people have all these past ideas and past references of service, but I'm, I mean, if you follow your glee and your joy and you really tune in to what is it that, that brings the most happiness to me, what can I give, what can I share, what can I extend, that's where we find the escape from the ego, is letting the Holy Spirit use us. Being used by the Holy Spirit and by the Christ is the, is the way of waking up. That's, that's the most simple, direct way I can say it. So here, she's just decided this time she's, she's going to sleep in a little bit longer. Good for her. She just, she didn't hop in the car with her girlfriend. She just, she probably just laid in bed for another hour and a half pondering what is the purpose of all this. That's a good use of time. That's a good use of time. What is the purpose? She was in bed. And then when her mom takes her and drops her off at school, Cupid's Day again, her mom's dropping her off. And, and basically her mom tells her how uncomfortable she felt when she was younger and people said her eyes were too close and, and so forth. And then she says, Samantha says, you know, you're beautiful. Wow. You can see Jesus is in action. Just an hour and a half of pondering, what is this all about? And now she's like, Mom, you, you're beautiful. So she's starting to let the truth come through her because she, that's her calling now. She's, she's answering the call already here in the second day of the loop. You know, she's starting to be taken over by the Christ mind for her true purpose. Okay, here we go. Okay. I saw Micah and Amanda, they noticed the unwind your mind symbol on the phone. Jesus was like saying, I'm going to help unwind you. But you see, Sam was mainly concerned whether it would make it to 1240. Because she was concerned of whether she actually died in a car crash or whether she could change the dream or whether this was this was her her girlfriends were real the scenario was real and that 
she could not go to the party and she could not get into the car and not have that car crash scene uh, replay. And the angels again are laughing because the presumption is there's a difference between real world life, everyday daily life and dreams. And what Jesus is teaching us is unwind your mind because it's all dreams. What you experience to, during your daytime is a dream. What you experience at nighttime is a dream. Jesus would, would say Sigmund Freud got this part right. Sigmund Freud said the dreams were wish fulfillment. And the world you perceive is wish fulfillment. It's all being generated in the mind. And who you are is not a figure in that dream that you're perceiving, even though you may identify with the figures while you're dreaming it, but that is all part of a dream. There is, there's no such thing as some dreams that are called real life and some dreams that are called just dreams or nighttime dreams or daydreams. Um, there's no difference between what people call fantasy and reality because this world is a world of fantasy, period. All dreams are fantasy fulfillment. And the fantasy is the wish that you could be separate from God. So all dreams of fragmented perception are fantasy fulfillment, not in reality, because this isn't reality. It's just wish fulfillment. Freud had that part right. It's like dreams are wish fulfillment. And Jesus is saying that that's, that's true, but also everything you perceive is a dream without exception. There is no reality to the perceptual world of time and space. So once she sees, she, unlike Micah and Amanda, they saw the sign there, it was the unwind the mind symbol, they got the, they got the correct symbol from Jesus, but she was focused on the clock above, and she was focused on the clock so that she could see if she would live, that the world would go on past that time. But already the world was going on every day. Every day she's repeating the same day. The world's going on. But the, the question in the mind is, am, am I dead or am I alive? Jesus is like, we don't have to think like that. You're dreaming. Now let's start to look at the content of your dream. Are you happy with the dream that you're dreaming? <laughs> you see how Jesus is looking at the content. Let's look at the essence of how you feel. Are your dreams happy dreams or not so happy? And Jesus is telling us we're not going to wake up. We're not going to come to the present moment. We're not going to see it's all simultaneous until we start to have a dream of non-judgment where we don't judge anything. And it's starting to happen here with Samantha, as we see. The beginning of the movie, she had she wanted nothing to do with Kent. And she wanted everything to do with Rob, the popular guy. Slowly, now she's starting to say, Rob and I are having issues. And listen, it's not going anywhere. And Kent keeps showing up in her dream. And this time he he has a bunch of roses for her <laughs> at her locker. And this time he says, come to my party. He's always inviting the party. Do you, do you know the address? Remember when you came? It was the third grade when she went over there. And she says, well, that was only once. But Kent never forgot that day. Here's a guy who's felt this love for her all these years since the third grade when she came over to his house once. <laughs> and she's off with the popular girls and the popular boyfriend and drinking and worrying about losing her virginity. And then now she's starting to question everything. But slowly, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm the one who sends in the witnesses to you. And if you'll do miracles for me, I'll send you witnesses of those miracles. The big thing is, you don't get to choose the form. 
Jesus tells us in, a, in the introduction to A Course in Miracles, he says, free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum, only that you can choose what you want to take at a given time. And then in the manual for teachers, he says that you can't even decide the form of the curriculum. Wow. Uh-oh. That means I, I guess I don't get to choose the people I'm relating to. Oh, I can't decide who's, who I'm going to relate to in my dreamscape or not. They're all just witnesses of, of Jesus's love, if I choose for them to be that. Or they can be witnesses to the ego's darkness, attack thoughts, you see? So you right now she's starting to realize she doesn't have control of whether it's a dream or not. And she she's starting to see that maybe she didn't see all the characters accurately. She's now starting to look at Juliet and, and she's saying to her girlfriends, why do we hate her? Remind me, why, why do we hate her? That's good. Jesus is getting a hold of her mind. Why do we hate her? Also with Kent, she's starting to, to stay a little more open to Kent every single time she sees him. Beginning of the movie, she wanted nothing to do with him. And then she would just ignore him. And then she would say, get your hands off me to him. And here's her childhood friend who slowly is coming back in as a witness for love. As her mind is changing, as she's starting to realize the purpose for the world, the witnesses are starting to change and reflect the love in her mind. She's saying to her mom, you're, you're just, you're beautiful. You know, she's telling her mom she's beautiful. She's opening to Kent. She's starting to question with her girlfriends, like, why do we, why do we hate her? Why do we hate Juliet? And they're trying to remind her, well, we hate her because what happened in the fifth grade, mellow yellow, we hate her because she's, she paints and she's artistic and we're, we're not. We're the cool girls and she's the freaky girl with the long hair who paints pictures. You see, it, the ego is always trying to maintain separation and use the past as a justification for maintaining separation. And the Holy Spirit's always pulling us together saying, love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. Start to realize that all these characters in your dream are just aspects of what you're dreaming. And you need to learn to accept them all because without judgment, all things are equally acceptable. Without judgment, all people are equally acceptable. Imagine you had a table and, and you could invite anyone you want to the table. And you're used to inviting the same friends and family and everything to the table. But then you have Jesus come as a guest and he says, Oh, I've, I've expanded the table. I went into your kitchen. I multiplied the food. I multiplied the drink. It's going to be a big party in your house now. And, um, and all he wants you to say is, Jesus, why don't you pick the guest? You tell me who should come to my table. Instead of me picking them from past reference point from past preferences from past you know beliefs why don't i just say i'm so happy to be at the table with you now you pick the guest and he will bring all the guests to that table that you still need to forgive if you if vladimir putin is going to sit at the, the head of the table <laughs> you got you got any upset with vladimir he's like Jesus is like, well, here's my friend from Russia, and he's he's been doing an Academy Award to get you to forgive grievances in your mind. Uh, he should win Actor of the Year this year, but he's at the head of the table. What about the other head? Well, I'm going to call one of my ghosts from the past. Adolf Hitler is going to be at one end of your table, and we're going to put Vladimir at that end. And... Uh, Jesus is like, you got a problem with the guest list? Oh, you do? Okay, well, here's, you know, that relative of yours, that mother-in-law that you can't stand, 
come on in, Frida. <laughs> come on, in. you sit right next to Frida. You come on over here. Uh, this is a forgiveness feast, and Jesus is going to bring everyone that you have judged against to that feast. And Jesus has got the biggest smile on his face because he knows that you can't be happy consistently until you forgive your brothers and sisters, until you forgive the ones that you hate. He's going to keep inviting them to the party. But in this movie, we're seeing Jesus keeps bringing Sam, Samantha back to the same, same day, same party, same people. But now she's starting to say, hmm, why do we hate her? <laughs> you see, isn't that beautiful? And that's what Jesus wants you to do at his table too. Now, why, why did I hate Vladimir? And why did I hate Hitler? You know, why, what was it in myself that I still judged against myself, that I still grabbed hold of the ego? What, what in my own mind needs to be forgiven? And then Jesus brings in all the characters to help that make that possible. Because he wants us to come back to the present moment. He knows we'll only be happy in the present moment. So as long as we keep using historical figures uh, from the past to try to justify why we're upset, now we're not going to know the kingdom of heaven if we keep judging the past. And then maybe you think there'll be some characters in the future, your soulmate, you know, oh, David, I'm praying for my soulmate, and I'm praying for my soulmate, and, and I'm hoping in maybe a year or two, maybe a few months. <laughs> no, 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 the soulmate is not in the future. I'll tell you, you know, whatever's in the here and now is your soulmate. <laughs> and that's, that's just bringing us back to the present moment to start to realize it's all happening in our mind. It's not an external world of good, bad, right, and wrong. The, it's not external moralities. It's not external ethnic, ethnical uh, constructs. It's, it's, am I willing to forgive the grievance of believing I'm separate from my creator? Now that's the, that's the core belief. That's the core thing that Jesus is going for the jugular. He's going right. He said, come with me, we'll overlook the ego. Don't worry with the effects. Let's, uh, let's overlook the ego. And then you'll see that uh, none of the effects were, were making you feel the way you are. You generated the effects using the ego, but you don't have to do that anymore. So here we go. I love the main character. She's transforming with every single scene that she sees. So you can see this is the, the time for faith in the awakening when she starts to see that the world isn't changing, uh, even though she's trying to do things different, um, she gets very disillusioned and she gets very rebellious. She's like, well, I'm just gonna do whatever I wanna do then. And this is where the ego appeals to your mind to be autonomous and go it on its own. But if you'll remember, our, our very first one is learning to, th to think, let go of thinking for myself. This idea of private thoughts is so deep that when things seem to go difficult or things don't seem to change the way that you want them to change, this is when people try to be very autonomous and come up with this attitude of, I'll just do whatever I want to do then. And then that also brings dark witnesses, like she's getting from her girlfriends. Um, and even when she dresses up very dark and dresses in a, in a more, what her mother might call provocative way, then she's still drawing forth witnesses. But when she meets I think her name is Anna, in the, in the bathroom, she has a moment there where she sees that, that she's going through an experience where every day feels like the same day with a few differences. And then Anna 
reflects back to her, that's the story of my whole life. She's starting to realize that she can't judge who her friends are and who her enemies are. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, very good. If you're still judging the world in terms of friends and enemies, you're not going to see the world the way I see it. Because Jesus doesn't see some people as friends and some people as enemies. That's how the ego set the world up. But here he's showing her through Anna in the, in the bathroom, and he's showing her a little bit at a time that what she thought she wanted, she didn't really want. She's still hurting from feeling like she lost her, she's just started to be more honest and let the private thoughts up and now her three besties have basically pulled away from her. But she's actually starting to get a better sense that maybe what she thought she wanted, she didn't really want. So then she throws herself at Rob. <laughs> We're back to Rob again. <laughs> she throws herself this time at Rob and right away they start to have sex. And then he says, uh, I love you. Is that what you wanted me to say? Wow, Rob is really acting it out in the middle of, of sexual relations. Uh, I love you. Is that what you wanted me to say? And she had already told her girlfriends at the table a couple of days before, I'm not just going to say I love you because I want to have sex with him. She was wanting connection. She's wanting communication. She's wanting to have a heart to heart relationship and open her heart up and expand and grow. And now she flings herself one more time and she wham gets the reflection back from Rob. And then when she starts walking where she is now in the movie, she's just, she's starting to wander because she's starting to realize, wow, maybe I don't know what I want. Maybe I've been chasing the wrong things. Maybe my values and my preferences for a happy life have not been actually in alignment. And maybe I've slumped something inside is starting to just show her yeah, you've been looking for love in all the wrong places, in too many faces. You've been imagining where you're going to find the love in form. And that's not it. So she's kind of wandering through the, the hallways now. She's reached a total disillusionment with Rob. It's gone from we have issues to, oh my God, what did I ever think I saw in Rob? And what was I ever looking for? In Rob, you know, it's gone, the meter has gone in the other direction. And this is precisely the time where Jesus will come rushing through into your mind to say, Yeah, now you're seeing what you don't want. Good, 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 good. But there is something that you really do want. You do want the connection. You do want the communication. You do want that feeling of heart to heart like your brother or your sister are the same one, that you are the same self, that you're, you're more than close, you're actually identical, you're the same Christ self. That's where Jesus is leading with all this. So let's see, now we see some beautiful symbols starting to come in right after Samantha has reached her lowest point of disillusionment around what she thought love was. That's when Jesus comes rushing in to lift you up, to show you the truth. That's how the transformation occurs. You know, she, she goes through the devastation. She feels Kent's love and acceptance. And the next morning when the new day comes, I thought if I'm going to have to repeat the day, I want to make it a worthy day, not just for me. She wants a worthy day for everyone. She wants a worthy day for everyone that she meets. And right away, she goes to her little sister. She's going to spend the day with her, listen to her little sister's fears, give her love and encouragement. And, and, then, um, and then also the spirit's using it too. The, the, little, the little sister says, why, why are, are you so angry at mom? And she's at first she's in denial. I'm not angry at mom. And then 
the little girl persists, well, you drew nail polish on the floor and you said, can't cross this line. And so you can see how quick, even when she opens up to live a worthy day and be helpful, the witnesses will show her where she's still holding on to the anger, where she's still not being consistent, where she's still not being true. The thing we have to remember is no one is against us. There is not a single person in our entire dreamscape that is against us, that all of the witnesses are come and they all come to us bearing gifts. Some of the ones that we have judged as being not trustworthy or not faithful or uh, lying and cheating, you know, they were there just showing us where we still had deceit in our mind, where we still were lying, where we still needed to forgive and release the, the anger, release the grievance. So as Jesus says in the Course, you know, your brothers are always worthy of gratitude, you know, both for their expressions of love and their calls for love. And, and that is the key to spiritual transformation, is to be in such a prayerful state that even when you're with someone and it triggers something, or the darkness starts coming up, or you, you see these judgmental thoughts, like, oh, I can't trust them, or yeah, they're just, they're not being honest to me, and so on and so forth. Those are just private thoughts coming up into awareness to be released. That's all. There are no enemies. That There has never been a single person in our life who has ever done anything wrong to us. They just played the part so that we could forgive them and free our mind. So you can see with the table, with the feast I was talking about, with Vladimir Putin in one end and, and uh, could be anybody you want, uh, Hitler, Osama bin Laden, your mother-in-law, anybody, anybody you don't like, anybody that you find irritating and annoying, then just say, Jesus, if that's what it takes for me to let go of the grievance, bring them into my table, bring them into my dreamscape so I can be free. What does it come to? Bottom line, God is for us. God just wants you to be happy. That's the only God created you happy. And God wants you to be happy because that's God's will. There is nothing against you. There has never been in all of history one thing that has been against the mind. This is all happening for the awakening. There is no hinder, hindrances. There's no real blocks. There are, you know, I... I remember, um, I remember I, I, my first relationship, uh, male-female romantic relationship, was back when I was in uh, graduate school. <laughs> Took a while, <laughs> graduate school, in uh, at the University of Cincinnati, and it was brought up a lot. <laughs> Jesus, I think I was Jesus, like, yeah, it's time to actually start to forgive here and uh, <laughs> really get with the program here. So, you know, I after maybe 27 years of not having a relationship in that way, Jesus is like, I think you're ready. You've got my course now, and I think we're going to speed it up here a little bit. But I remember it was a pretty intense relationship. And then and she, in my eyes, was more of a fundamentalist Christian, heaven and hell and sacrifice and penance and everything. Good. Jesus really speed it up. Let's forget all, this, all these ideas that you have in your mind. And then, um, and then there was a miracle that happened, and and I, but I didn't see her for maybe a decade or so. And then years, years later, I get a Facebook message, and she just said a few words. It was just a Facebook message, and it it just said, "David, hell is real." <laughs> She said, I watched one of your videos. This was years, many, many years later. I, David, I just have one, I watched one of your videos and hell is real. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, okay, Jesus, we <laughs> dig down there for that scrap. Let's get it all. Let's get to vacuum this thing out. 
<laughs> because that's the only purpose of any communication. She was doing me a favor. <laughs> she was doing a favor after all those years by saying, hell, I watched one of your videos, hell is real. Because, you know, in the end, it's all about this moment and coming to this moment. And anything that takes us into the moment is for us. It's all happening for us. So here we go. We're just, we're now seeing Samantha going through her transformation as uh, she's just opening and opening. Her heart is opening up so much. And she's she's starting to let go of, of the favorite friends or the, the enemies and judging the world and just saying, let me be truly helpful here. Let me have a worthy day and let me grow and expand through this worthy day. What a beautiful outlook on, on the world. When that's your outlook, you're, you're in for lots of healing. Okay, now we're reaching, we're really getting close to the healing because the healing means being in the presence of love and allowing the private thoughts to come up. So first thing was when uh, Samantha was there with Kent, she went to his room, she saw the picture of, of him and her when she was back in third grade and they climbed the tree together and used to sit into the tree. And then she came in full love and presence and allowed him to bring up his hurt, his, his private thoughts which is that, you know, his, his father had died. He had so much hurt that he could barely function. And then he, he goes to school and um, this uh, guy knocks the food, his food on the floor and makes fun of him and insults him. And she, Samantha, stands up for Kent and that he always saw her as like his hero. She didn't know that. She didn't see that. She just drifted off into trying to be the popular girl, the cool girl with the cool friends, date the cool boyfriend and everything. But there was a whole story of private thoughts that were underneath that were hidden all along. And then when he she goes to help uh, Juliet and she chases her through the night forest. Finally, there she is again in presence and Juliet was saying, you know, you hate me. And, and when Samantha says, you know, no, it's not what she, Lindsay's, no, it's not, she didn't mean it. Then the whole story of, it was actually Lindsay who peed there. Lindsay and Juliet were best friends. Lindsay P, but she projected the blame, the lie onto Juliet to cover her self-concept. And all these years was giving Juliet the name Yellow Mellow. That's a beautiful symbol of how the ego tries to project the blame to the form and then repeats the form over and over all those years from fifth grade, all through junior high, all through high school, uh, Juliet, Juliet felt ostracized for something that she didn't do. She simply was tagged with this mellow yellow thing. She was the outcast. And it all started with Lindsay thinking, ah, I, I need to, uh, I've got to protect my reputation to be the cool girl. So pinned it on her best friend and then had nothing to do with her best friend. That's how the ego works. It always projects the blame and then it tries to disassociate, you know, label and dismiss. The ego tried to label Juliet as the problem and then totally for years and years and years dismiss her until Juliet seemed to lose all hope and said, nothing matters anymore. It's too late. And so you could see both encounters, the one with Kent and the one with Juliet, were both there for Samantha to start to say, I'm here for you, I want to connect with you. And more than that is the spaciousness for Kent to tell 
all of his private thoughts, to let them up. He felt safe enough to let up all his private thoughts. And then and Juliet feels safe enough to let up all her private thoughts, all the torture she'd gone through, all the feeling of rejection and abandonment. Her best friend calling her a name for something that she didn't do. And then her just feeling like she was like pushed away and kept out and hated for something that she never even did. And this is the predicament of the sleeping Christ. The sleeping Christ feels guilty for something it never did. <laughs> it never, Christ could never separate from God. It's impossible. It, it, but the belief that something terrible went wrong, the belief in, and the feeling of guilt for I have to make up for it somehow, I have to find my way back, the, the, the guilt of the human condition is all based on a belief in sin. And here we are in Easter weekend, and Jesus is telling us and showing us in the movie, you know, you cannot sin because to sin would be to separate from your creator. And Jesus is telling us that's absolutely impossible. You are as God created you. God hasn't changed God's mind about you, but you changed your mind about God. And then you made up a world of complete unreality that reflected that. And then you have to go back. Jesus says, you haven't gone back far enough. You have to come back into simultaneity. That should be our, our new buzzword for 2022, simultaneity. That's all happening at once, all at once. <laughs> like the title of the movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. Because that's where we're innocent. Once we try to explain it on the timeline, you know, you don't even have to explain this to people. Because if you try to explain it, people will say, well, it sure seems real. And it sure seems like men and women are sinners and that they all need the sinner's prayer. <laughs> and, you know, the whole thing that we're used to with Christianity, all of that seems necessary if sin were real. <laughs> That's what I had to face when my ex-girlfriend from many years after that watched one of my YouTube videos and left me a little message on Facebook Messenger. Hell is real. <laughs> That's what that was about. You know, I had to go, hmm. <laughs> okay, let's face this, you know, because, because that's actually, there's only one of us. <laughs> and the messages keep coming until we can see past them, you know. That's one of our uh, goals was, was help overlooking the error. That's one of our themes, you know, to not think by ourselves, to not try to think by ourselves and, and to overlook the error, to call on spirit to overlook the error. So here we are, we're all in there. We all have, I mean, uh, Samantha, just had a nice heart opening connecting with, with Kent. And it was going pretty well there with Lindsay uh, until uh, Lindsay took off running. <laughs> and then, and then it was like, so here we go. We're revving up for another loop. <laughs> Just like with me, when I opened that Facebook messenger, hell is real. I had to face, <laughs> I had to face that. Lindsay, all of them, Samantha, they all are going for another. Now, okay, Jesus, show us how it's done. Show us how it's done with grace. The name of this movie is Before I Fall. Before I fall from grace, I must be divine innocence. Before I fall, I must be the way, the truth, and the life before I fall. <laughs> I must be one with God before I fall. <laughs> so we have to pray to go back now to see whatever we need to see to get back to that full-blown experience of our love and innocence, because that's what the prayer is. It's not, we don't forgive anybody through words. You know, of course, Samantha was doing her best there, trying to really extend and connect and, and show her care 
but uh, the words aren't enough. It has to be deeper than the words. We know that. We know it has to be in our heart. So here we go. Enjoy to the fullest. Oh. <laughs> There's our Easter message. At the end, Juliet saying, Sam, Sam, you saved me. On the linear perspective saying, you saved my body from being hit by the moving vehicle. And then Sam speaking from the moment of before I fall. No, you saved me. You saved my mind. You reminded me of, of what I wanted to teach and what I wanted to learn. You know, you're, you're perfect just the way that you are. And as she told her little sister, you don't change. You're, you're perfect the way you are. You don't need to change anything. That's the greatest teaching and the greatest gift you could ever offer is to let all things be exactly as they are. No attempt to fix the world, to change the world, to improve the world, to improve people. All the linear ideas that were about trying to make things better in the world are all part of the defense against the present moment. Right now, you are perfect exactly as you are, exactly as you are. And, and that is the whole teaching of A Course in Miracles. It's when Jesus says, when I awoke, you were with me. He's, he's not saying that this is gonna be some kind of long, tedious, linear dream. He's just saying, please join with me and just accept this moment exactly as it is. And how would you go through the day if, if you were just offering love and offering complete acceptance and not trying to change any of the circumstances, your motive for the future will, will vanish. And, and you're just left with a complete acceptance in this moment. You don't have to try to fix something. You don't have to try to make up for something. You never did anything wrong. Like in the movie Goodwill Hunting, when when Robin Williams tells the Matt Damon character, you, you didn't do anything wrong. You're, it's not your fault. That's all we've ever wanted to hear. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. So, wow, what a, what a beautiful movie to take us all the way, where in the end, all Sam wanted to do was to give, to give the love. And, and it was a gift of the heart and a gift of the mind, not a gift of, of the body. <laughs> For her, she said, you saved me. You, you saved me from this crazy idea of, of time. What a powerful movie. What a powerful movie, because it's, it's showing us that we can actually accept things exactly as they are. We don't have to think we have to figure out a way to make it better, which is where the guilt comes in. When you try to believe something went wrong and now you have to fix somebody or figure it out. So, wow. I am so grateful to be able to share this with you. This is, <laughs> this is Jesus sending his blessings through this movie. <laughs> that you're perfect just exactly as you are right now, and you never did anything wrong. Never, never did anything wrong. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs>